All right, guys, this video is one that's probably gonna stir the pot among pilots uh, across the internet. It's something that's a topic that's been pretty polarizing in online groups and forums. And uh, it's probably the one that uh, the, the few haters that I do have and the AV haters, this is the video to just dig into me on. Anyway, we are going there. We are talking about water skiing. I'm gonna talk to you about how to do it, why you probably shouldn't, and how I got violated by the FAA for doing so. I'm Trent Palmer, I fly drones for a living and bush planes for fun. Follow along as I journey off the beaten path of aviation. All right, before we get into this, I do want to do my little disclaimer. I am not a CFI, I am not a physicist, I'm just a kid with a Kit Fox and a YouTube channel and a basic understanding of how the physics and the, the act of water skiing works. So please don't take this as any sort of true instructional video, you know, never let this replace any actual instruction from a certified flight instructor. This is more meant to just be an open conversation about a, a hot topic that has been uh, recirculating the internet. So what is water skiing? Water skiing or water skimming is when you drag the tires of an aircraft on water. It's a technique used by Alaskan bush pilots for decades to land on short gravel bars or sandbars or shorelines. They use it as basically an approach to land. It's also a technique a few of my friends have used to wreck their airplanes. Now you might be wondering why in the world would anyone do something so stupid? It's a silly risk, it's unnecessary, all that. And that's, the, that's normally the common argument I see online. I don't wanna to go too far into that. Everyone draws their risk assessment in a different area. So, you know, everything in life is a calculated risk. Walking out your door in the morning is a calculated risk. And, you know, to each one's own. I have friends that fly wingsuits off mountains that proximity fly. Um, that sport uh, by nature has a very high mortality rate. So it's uh, pretty dangerous. But I'm not someone that goes and hates on them for the risks they're willing to take. It's just not one that I'm willing to take. So for the sake of this argument, if your only argument is that's an unnecessary risk, I'm gonna say that's kind of null uh, to each one's own on that one. But the primary use for water skiing is the approach to landing aspect of it. Now, when used properly, it's gonna give you an advantage of landing on a short gravel or sandbar or shoreline that you don't have that much room because you're gonna be able to touch down on the first inch of dry shore, get maximum braking at the lowest possible airspeed versus the other option of just trying to hit your mark when you could either float past it or stall a little high, end up with a mechanical bounce, giving up valuable braking room. Obviously, this is a little bit of a weird situation because you still gotta get out of there, so it can make sense in times if you're flying in heavier than you're gonna fly out, say you're dropping off river rafters and they're gonna meet you down the river, or maybe the winds are pushing you to where you actually have to land with a tailwind because there's a closeout you can't get in the other way. That could be a time when you'd use it. Um, the argument that you land a whole bunch shorter is kind of not always true because your brakes are wet, so that braking that you do get to use once you get on the ground is less effective than it is normally. Overall, it's a pretty fun way and it is a good way to be completely stabilized when you get to that sand or gravel bar. As far as the physics and everything that goes into it, I know that there's been some FAA uh, research done on hydroplaning. However, I, I believe the actual form of hydroplaning they're talking about is when there's a thin layer of water over a hard surface which will actually act as a different barrier that's basically gonna lower the amount of traction you have. It's like what will happen in your car. Anyone that's driven on a freeway and hit a puddle knows that you're gonna lose traction as soon as you go over that, which obviously is a little different than water skiing in open water. So really quickly, let's talk about the physics at play here. Now, obviously at really high speeds, the surface tension of water gets really hard. So it's something that, I mean, you can look at a barefoot water skier as an example. Someone that's 200 pounds can ski basically on the heels of their feet at about 40 miles an hour. And that's with the rope for the boat pulling them down. They've got a whole bunch of stuff working against them, but there's so much tension on the water at those speeds that they're able to skim across it. So then when you look at something like an aircraft, like mine, for example, me with you know half tank of fuel and the airplane, I'm about 1200 pounds. And then I've got these huge balloon tires. 
So when you look at the relationship of the amount of surface area you're touching versus the weight, we're pretty dang close to the barefoot water ski thing. Although I do most of my water skiing with an airplane faster unless you really are coming up to land. Most of the time I'm in the 60 to 70 mile an hour starting range. Now really quickly, there's a couple myths and misconceptions to this. I actually had one guy tell me that, oh yeah, water skiing is all fun and games until you touch your brakes, then you're gonna flip upside down and drown. Now this brought to light a lot more of the misknowledge to water skiing and the physics at play because it was interesting to me that someone would think that just touching your brakes on the water would cause the plane to flip upside down and drown. Well, the simple response to that is at the speed I've water skied at at 60 to 70 miles an hour, if I was running my tires down a runway at those same speeds and I touched my brakes, you know what would happen? I'd go skidding down the runway like so many student pilots do when they try to grab brakes when they're still too fast. My plane's still flying. It's not really putting that much weight on the tires. so. Just grabbing the brakes uh, when you're water skiing really doesn't change much. I mean, effectively what's gonna happen if you touch the brakes while water skiing, you get a slight pitching moment forward, you pull back on the stick a little bit, the plane stabilizes back out, and your wing struts get less wet because there's not as much water flinging off of them, just your tail's getting wet. So the actual pressure we're putting on our tires on the water is a lot less than the weight of your aircraft because we're flying, we're, I mean, you could pull back at any second and fly. So many people just seem to think that you touch the water and your wings shear off, but at the speeds you water ski at, most of the time, you're still at flying speeds. Your wing is still creating lift. So really when you look at the physics of it, it's not a miracle, it's nothing insane. It's actually very simple physics and simple science that's making it happen. The amount of tension on that water at those speeds is really incredible. I have a friend, I'm not gonna say his name, but uh, uh, one of my buddies was flying with another friend and they were over glassy water, which for one is dangerous and we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, he was flying, he was distracted, looking at his friend, trying to talk him down from doing something stupid. He ended up impacting the water. He was going about 80 miles an hour because he didn't see that he was getting close to the water. Hit so hard that he said he folded down into his seat, his headset hit the floor, everything. But he bounced off that like a student's first time landing. And he could not believe the surface tension, but it just goes to show water is extremely hard at those speeds. So obviously, speed is your friend. There's no real black magic to this. The surface tension at those speeds is pretty incredible. It is when you get slow that the danger starts to set in. Now the other side of the argument of this is what if you were to uh, penetrate and go in and, and go swimming? And you know, the, that brings up a pretty good safety talk in its own because if you were to get slow enough that your wheels were to penetrate, it's gonna flip your plane upside down and you're gonna have probably a pretty rattled up state of mind and now you're trying to get out of an aircraft while you're upside down, hanging from your seat belts that are normally bound up, trying to get out as water's rushing in, pushing your doors and windows to where you can't open them. Now bear in mind, a lot of these planes are not easy to get into and out of when they're sitting upright and you're in a perfectly calm state of mind. So I could only imagine if you're flipped upside down with water rushing into your airplane right after you just got totally disoriented after flipping upside down in the water, it could pretty quickly turn into a uh, life or death situation with actually being able to get out of there without drowning, especially when you factor in the pressure on the doors, you not even being able to open the doors, you may have to wait for the entire thing to equalize underwater. It's not a good thing, which I think is the big argument. And overall, that's part of the reason why I'm gonna say I wouldn't recommend doing this if you're thinking about it. But I realize that there's gonna be a few of you guys that are out there and this this is actually because I've gotten a lot of messages in the past asking, hey, I'm going to go water ski, do you have any tips? Normally my tip is what it will be right now, don't. But if you're going to do it anyway, as I know some people are, I'd rather at least give you guys some hints and tips to uh, make it a little safer before you go out and try something that is uh, potentially a little hazardous and a little outside the normal operations of, of flight. Now the first thing, before anyone goes and attempts this, I highly recommend that you have big tires on your airplane. I would not do it with a nose wheel aircraft. I've seen it done, but yeah, if, you, if you get that nose wheel dipped into the water, I don't think you're gonna be pulling it back out. And again, going swimming is not gonna be a fun thing and it could be pretty dangerous, immediately life-threatening. Also, I would say you should be very comfortable in your aircraft, be able to grease a wheel landing every single time. If you're someone that's still trying to figure out where the runway is and you're bouncing, sometimes you're running into it, you're not ready. And just honestly being on the safe side, it's better just to say you're not ready. I think us as pilots, we take pride in our skills and our knowledge and in doing so, sometimes we have maybe a, a somewhat inflated view of, of our own skill set. So if you're thinking about doing this, maybe just take a second and say, you know, am I really ready and is it really worth it? And then the main thing to keep in mind, if you're going to do this, I would do it at a, a higher speed, start at 65, 70 miles an hour, depending on your airplane. I do it with flaps in because I like to be able to see over the front 
any additional lift is also gonna help. And the biggest thing is we're talking about water speed here. So you need to keep in mind water speed. I don't recommend doing it into the wind because your actual speed over the water is gonna be a lot slower. If it's a river, do it up river. Don't be doing it with the flow because in reality you could be saying, oh, I'm gonna water ski to the sandbar. My approach puts me into the wind, but I'm going down river. Now you might have an indicated airspeed of say 40 or 50 on your approach, but if you have a headwind of 10 miles an hour and then the water's going with you at another five miles an hour, all of a sudden you're going only 25 over the water and you're getting pretty close to that danger zone of truly penetrating. Now again, I highly recommend that you don't do it, but if you were gonna go and do it the first time, do not rush it, do it close to the shore. You want there to be a little bit of ripple in the water. Perfectly glass is dangerous. Uh, float plane guys will uh, explain that a little bit more, but essentially your depth perception goes to crap. You can't really see, but if you're close to shore, at least you have some reference of height. Also, um, it gives you a better chance if you were to flip, worst case scenario, that you could get to shore. Don't go do it out in the middle of a huge lake because you're pretty much guaranteed you're gonna drown out there. And really, the biggest thing is don't rush it. Anytime you're doing it, don't push the thing onto the water, just wait for it to come. Most likely, the first time you touch the water, you'll bounce off of it because it is, like I said, uh, super firm. The surface tension is insane at those speeds. Also, once you do touch down, anticipate a little bit of drag, so you're probably gonna have to add a little bit more power pull back on the stick a slight bit, it's not huge. Also, one thing to look out for as well is if your tires start bobbing up and down, that's an indication that you're starting to penetrate the water. Basically, your tires are starting to dip under and pop back out, you'll start skipping. That means you're too slow, full throttle, get out of there. You're in a bad place, that's when you're just about to penetrate. Again, I feel like I shouldn't even be telling you guys how to do this, but I'm just hoping that if someone was gonna do it anyway, maybe I can help you do it a little bit safer. Also, one other big thing, make sure to do it solo. Don't be bringing anyone else out there your first time doing it. And really, you shouldn't be water skiing with a passenger anyway. Um, that falls under the kind of 9113 careless and reckless uh, FAR, which is one that they got me on. But either way, the first time you do it especially, don't be risking any more than you need to. Again, guys, I don't recommend doing it. I'm just uh, telling you how I've done it. <laughs> All right, now let's get into the part that some of you guys have probably been waiting for, which is how I got violated for doing this. Um, this actually happened over a year ago. It's something I kind of kept quiet because I wasn't really proud of it. Still am not super proud of it. But just to give you a little backstory, before this incident, I had discussed the topic of water skiing or water skimming with multiple FAA inspectors. I've always gotten kind of mixed responses, but no one could really point me at a regulation that was at play. And most of them said, well, you know, it could be careless and reckless with the passenger. And I'm like, I understand that, that anytime you endanger the life of another person, it can be considered careless and reckless. Which again, is it's kind of the FAA's rubber rule. They can kind of throw that at you anytime you have a passenger, if they feel like you did anything they don't like. So it's a kind of weird one. I don't know how it sticks in court. Um, I wasn't someone that wanted to push it that far to find out. But basically how my story happened and how I ended up getting violated for it was I was flying over Tahoe with a friend. Um, we did a, a flight by a friend that was on a dock, you know, staying our, our safe 500 feet from him. And uh, we came back for another photo. We had him on the phone. He said, yeah, come back by. And my passenger said, hey, Trent, can we do, you know, water ski? I've seen you do it in all your videos. I said, well, you know, I really shouldn't, not with the passenger on board. I basically said no. And he said, come on, please. And I said, well, you understand there's a, uh, an additional level of risks here that aren't normally there. He said, I'm comfortable. And we had this verbal discussion about a quick little safety protocol. I said, if we were to penetrate, open that door immediately and get out, this thing's gonna fill with water. You, basically, I tried to cover my, my bases that said, uh, you know, I'm not trying to say I didn't do anything wrong because clearly I did. Basically, we went and did a water ski. It was uh, uneventful. A couple weeks later, I got a letter in the mail from the US Department of Transportation. It was a certified letter that you have to sign for. And it was a letter of investigation saying that the FAA had received some photos that uh, another FAA guy was standing on the shore with the camera in hand and got some beautiful photos of me water skiing with a passenger on Lake Tahoe. My luck, right, that there's like an FAA guy standing with a telephoto lens and a camera in hand as I do. The one time I, I, I don't water ski with passengers and uh, yeah. But anyway, I got called in for a, a little discussion with the FAA inspector assigned to my case. He informed me that not only did I violate 9113, which is careless and reckless because I had a passenger, but 91119A, which is the uh, flight at a safe altitude FAR. Now I had assumed he was talking about part C of that regulation, which is 
referring to over open water, you have to stay 500 feet from vehicles, vessels, persons, and structures, which I was. So my argument was, well, no, I, I know I was farther than that away. And he said, no, we need to look at uh, part A. Now, I don't have the regulation right in front of me, but it basically states that at any time, a flight must be conducted at an altitude that in the event of an engine failure, an emergency landing can be conducted without undue hazard to persons or property on the surface. Now, I can't say that I fully still understand how this pertains since uh, the rule kind of states that you can create hazard in the event of emergency, it's just undue hazard. Um, I don't necessarily see how I was creating undue hazard to uh, more persons or property on the surface, but which overall, I don't necessarily know that I still see how it pertains. However, he's the inspector. He's the one that had cleared it all the way through the highest up in his office to take the full legal action. Should I want to go that direction? I didn't. You guys know me. I'm the first to fall on my sword and say, no, this was my bad. I, you know, I won't do it again. And luckily with the compliance philosophy that the FAA came out with in 2015, it gives pilots a chance to comply with regulations before the FAA can immediately seek legal enforcement action. So because of the fact that I was compliant, it ended up being just more of a corrective action, which ended up putting me on probation for 24 months. So no water skiing for me. But overall, what I learned from this is that even though I couldn't find where in the regulations it stated that it was illegal, you need to understand that depending on the optics and perspective of an FAA inspector, they can come after you for it. And it sounds like other guys have actually been violated for this and gone farther with it. Again, I wasn't one that was ready to take it to court. I did end up after the fact reaching out to the Office of Chief Counsel of the FAA requesting a legal interpretation of water skiing and how the rules apply. They got back to me with a letter saying your subject does not require legal interpretation. And they sent me to the AFS 800 office, which is one of the higher up FISDO offices. It's over in Washington, DC. Again, I requested a legal interpretation. What I got back was a uh, letter from the inspector there telling me how not only is water skiing careless and reckless, but landing anywhere but a paved runway can be careless and reckless because the performance numbers are not in your aircraft's operating handbook for landing anywhere but paved runways. And I never really was given legal interpretation on either of the rules and how they would apply to water skiing. Uh, more so, I was just given the inspector's opinion on the matter and uh, how, what they would consider careless and hazardous operations. So. To sum this one up, I know it's been a little long. I'm not water skiing because one, I'm on probation, and two, when I started looking at the risk assessment and started thinking about what would happen if I did penetrate, uh, I just decided it wasn't worth it. The one funny thing that came up across the board with all the FAA inspectors I spoke with was that if I was water skiing to shore, at that point it was part of your approach to land and 91119 is no longer applicable. So if I was water skiing to shore, it's perfectly legal. Or if I was using it as a departure technique, which I don't recommend, I know people have done it, but <laughs> you're walking a thin line there. But anyway, it was interesting to me that had I been landing or using it as an approach to land technique, then it's perfectly legal. However, in my experience through my friends and what I've witnessed, uh, normally it's the people that are coming into land that are getting extra slow that uh, end up penetrating and flipping upside down. I don't know of anyone that's actually done it out in open water. I'm sure it's happened, but it's not something that I've actually seen or heard of. And I don't know of anyone that's died doing it again. I'm sure someone probably has at some point. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap this one up here. I've been rambling on for way too long. To summarize all of this, if you're thinking about water skiing, well, one, just don't do it. Two, if you're gonna do it anyway, be safe. Use a couple of those tips that I mentioned and please make sure that you're ready before you go do it. Do it near shore, don't do it with a passenger, all of that, and be aware that you are opening yourself to potentially being violated for a few of those regulations. Anyway, hope you guys liked this video. If you did, hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't. Come be my wingman, and see you guys in the next one. Peace.